All right, welcome back. It is 2 o'clock Central Time, and it's time to start uh, with our next presentation. Uh, Jasmine Dean of the Port Niff District Library. I think I said that right. I'm, I'm getting better at it. Uh, she's going to be talking about working with the cloud. Jasmine, you are with us, correct? Yes, I am. All right, and I'm giving you presentation control. No, I'm not. Hold on just a second. This is the poll problem. You do hide the poll, and then we go like this. Uh, wait, I gotta take it back. Give me just a sec. Sorry. My screen. Change presenter. Jasmine. Okay, Jasmine. Now you should be able to take control. Okay. Beautiful. We see your dragonfly. Okay. Good. That means okay. that now you should be able to see my presentation. Yes, we do. Thank <laughs> you much. Off you go. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to introduce myself. My name is Jasmine Dean. I am the director of the Portniff District Library in Chubbuck, Idaho. It is a very small library. Uh, we don't have a significant amount of staff, and we certainly don't have an IT department uh, in any way, shape, or form. And even if I wanted to hire an IT department based on the fact that we pay $9 an hour, I really couldn't get sufficient IT at that going rate. So. Uh, to tell you a little bit about Chubbuck, which tells you a little bit about uh, my library. Chubbuck is a little town that is just north of Pocatello. We serve about um, 18,000 people in our rather large district area. We're a district library, so we do, do serve the entire School District 25 area, which is rather large. Um, but we are teeny tiny. Um, so I was driven to cloud computing when I first took over this library about a year and a half ago. Uh, when I arrived, there was nothing. The director used the personal email that was provided to her by the internet service provider. So she just had a dot quest office or an at quest office dot net email address. The librarians who did a lot of outreach and planning with the community just used their personal email accounts. Uh, the person who did interlibrary loan used her personal email accounts. So there was nothing and I didn't think that that was a good idea. I felt that we did need to have a much more professional presence uh, even though we were serving a much smaller community uh, simply because it was not to everybody's advantage to use their personal email and things like that for professional communication. We also had this wonderful thing uh, for for workflow, it was called a legal pad. And everybody would write down on the legal pad whenever somebody wanted to order a book or whenever somebody needed to make a note. And then there was lots of scratch marks on the legal pad and there was a lots of arrows up and down the sides of the margins. And that was essentially the technology available at the library. So I started looking around and based on the fact that I had no information on how to manage a server, Never mind the fact that I didn't have the money for a server. Never mind the fact that I didn't even have an extra internet ethernet port to put a server in or any of this kind of stuff. I started looking at cloud computing and I learned about Google Apps for Education. Google Apps for Education is cloud computing. It is accessible everywhere. And it also is totally mobile for smartphones and for, um, for tablet PCs and laptops and things like that. Uh, and you don't need any computer hardware, which was great because I couldn't afford any anyway. And you only need just a little of computer experience, uh, experience to implement Google Apps. Um, I'm certainly not an IT expert, and I was able to do this by myself. So you can get it done. Um, so what do you need? Well, the first thing that you'd want to think about is purchasing a domain. So I went out to the evil GoDaddy.com uh, who supported uh, SOPA and PIPA and all that stuff that was going on. Um, and I purchased a domain, portnifflibrary.org, and you can easily go to anybody who does any sort of domain sales. Uh, there's probably a local option that you could consider or you can consider some of the larger public online um, options for buying a domain. So I purchased the domain. I actually purchased four. So I purchased portnifflibrary.org, portnifflibrary.com, so on and so forth. Um, domains are really cheap. You just renew them each year. I think mine costs like $14 a year for each of them. So it's very easy to do. Uh, but you don't have to do this with a domain. 
So there are a lot of itty bitty little rural libraries in my corner of Idaho. And I know of a couple of libraries that only have one, maybe two people total working in them. And they just simply use a Gmail address. So they've set up Aberdeen Library at gmail.com. And they use all of the applications that are attached to that Gmail address. Now, of course, there are privacy issues that you need to consider with that because if you purchase or if you use the applications as um, an educational entity, then you do have levels of privacy that Google does not offer to the free accounts. So that's something that you can consider. But if it's just completely out of your realm to purchase a domain and you don't need to have you know, emails for 13 users or whatever, you can just use a regular old Gmail address. OK, so how do you implement it? Well, once you create your account, um, you log into what's called your dashboard. And this is your dashboard here. You have lots of different options for setup. The first thing you would do, of course, is click on the Setup tab, and it'll step you through setting up your Google Apps. It's really easy to do. There's lots of back and next buttons, uh, lots of text explaining you what you need to do, and it'll step you through the steps very easily. The first thing that you do is you set up your users and groups because, of course, you'll need to set up emails for uh, and accounts for your staff. So you can add users, set up groups, then you can choose your applications, and you don't have to choose all the applications at once. You can decide okay, we're going to start with email, and then maybe in a month we're going to go to calendaring, or maybe it's just really important that you have document, you have docs and you have um, spreadsheets. Uh, I know that when I took over, this library didn't even have Microsoft Office as an option. Everybody used um, Notepad. The senior staff had old versions of, um, oh, what is that, WordPerfect? And a few other people used open office. So you know maybe that's a priority that you actually provide some kind of word processing or spreadsheets to your staff. But you can choose your applications. And you can also set up other apps. So just like there's this huge explosion now for applications on Blackberries and Androids and iPhones, there are people who are building applications for Google Apps. And so you can set up some of those or explore them at your leisure. And of course, Google offers lots of training and support, lots of videos, lots of um, how-to guides that are really easy to follow. And they also have forums. So you can simply just post to the forum if you have a question, and you can read others' questions and, and people's answers as well. Um, there's pros and cons to the training and support issue. If you, if you don't pay for a business edition, so you just use the free because uh, Google Apps for Education is free if you're a 501c3 and you have less than 50 users. If you have more than 50 users, you do have to pay for Google Apps for Education, but you get a 40% discount because you're an educational entity. Um, we use the free version because we couldn't even invent 50 people uh, if we needed to. So, but the pros and cons um, certainly exist with that. So one of the big cons is that if you don't pay and you use the free version, you have to rely on Google searches and the forums to answer your questions. So if you have a particular problem, you're going to troll forums and you're going to be looking at what other people are trying to solve. Um, you do have the option of pay uh, per use for tech support. But this is often out of reach for rural and small libraries that have very minimal budget for technology. Um, so that's a con that you need to consider um, is that you know, you'll spend a lot of time reading forums and troubleshooting. And the forums can be helpful, but it's just good to know. OK, so the first step is to create new users. And you can see here that I have a list of all of my users. Um, I can see lots of information about them. I can also see when they've logged in. So if I sent an email and haven't seen that a particular staff member uh, is doing or following up, I can actually check to see when they've last logged in. Um, now you'll also notice that I have groups. So I, this is portnifflibrary.org. This is everybody. But I also have for my board, and I also have for the clerks. And I did put my board into my Google Apps because I wanted a level of transparency and I wanted them to see everything that I'm doing. 
And putting them in their own group means that they get uh, just a portion of what I share, so they're not you know, completely overwhelmed with every little bit of what's going on at the library. They can just get chunks. And then the clerks, of course, often I need to just say, hey, don't forget that such and such user. She often forgets disk six in her audiobooks. Make sure you double check all of her audiobooks when she comes in. I can just do those sorts of things and, and share easier by grouping people. You'll also notice down here I've got Service Desk 1 and Service Desk 2. And these are actual accounts that are logged in at our circulation desk. We have two computers there, and they're always logged in to one or two. And this way, my staff can sit down, and without having to log in, they can see the all staff emails. They have access to all the calendars. They have access to all of the documentation, policies, and everything without having to log into their own personal account. Um, it's also nice because since it's running all the time, I can use those features to just communicate directly to desk one or to desk two. Setting up a new user is super easy. Uh, you just simply provide first name, last name, and the email address. Um, it auto creates a password. You can either print it out and give it to staff or you can send it to their personal email and then they can log in. They'll have to change the password as soon as they uh, log in and use the temporary. Okay, creating groups I think is really important. I have three groups at the library. We have all staff because often I need to just send out an email to everybody. We also do a lot of proctoring for online students, so the four people who do proctoring have their own email address, and that email address is also shared with the institutions who email proctoring, and then all the proctors get the exams, get the information, so that we all as a team can work together. And then, of course, my senior staff, so that if I just need to email my programming librarians and my administrative assistant myself, because there's only four of us, um, I can just send out without having to type in um, their individual names. And groups are also really nice because then you can split up for different workflows. Um, it's really easy to add groups. You just would type in here to add new members. Um, you can change people's permissions and roles. Uh, you can click as member. There's some other different options. Um, this is the proctoring group. And for the roles and the permissions, I set it as custom because I did want anyone on the internet to email this email address because we have institutions from all over the West sending us information. So I needed it to be publicly accessible for them. Um, but only the library users can view members who are on the list. So you can set up different access levels for each of the groups. Okay, so let's get into some of the nitty-gritty of the apps themselves, now that we've talked a little bit about how to set up uh, your users. So I'm first going to talk about Google Mail, and I'm sure that a lot of you have a familiarity with Google Mail, uh, with Gmail. Um, most of us have Gmail accounts, completely web-based, uh, very mobile-friendly interface. You can also use the protocols for Gmail or MS Exchange in order to sync it with smartphones, which is really nice. Um, this is one of the huge benefits of cloud computing is that you can be anywhere on any device and access the work materials. So here's what the Gmail looks like. Um, it is completely web-based, like I said. It, and like I said, most of you have probably been familiar with this, so you have different navigation panes, and there's a lot of customization that you can do um, with setting up how you want to view. You can either have it threaded or non-threaded. You can have a preview pane or not. It really depends, and in the settings and labs, you have a lot of different options. I rely heavily on labels. Um, I label everything because then I sort by my labels later. So uh, there's also in the app uh, labs for um, keyboard shortcuts. And so I, I set all those up so that I can just use the labels. I can label everything that gets archived and then easily search it later. Um, follow up, of course, is one of my favorites. I'm a huge fan of inbox zero. So if I have to follow up with something, I'll follow it up and then I'll inbox it. But you can see here that each email has the labels attached to it. So I can see that this is part of my ILS. This is also part of our consortium work. And it's delegated to a staff member. 
Okay, so here is my follow-up folder where I can see all of the things that are followed up, and you can actually make colored stars and use color labels as well uh, based on how you want your workflow and, and it to appear. Um, all of your labels are also listed here. So you can quickly go directly into a label just like you would go into a folder in Outlook or Thunderbird. Uh, you can go straight into the labels as well, which is really kind of nice. And I love a lot, I've used these options all the time. Um, you have all kinds of different options for printing and viewing. You can create a group chat with some of these icons. You can email all of the people uh, really quickly. You can create the thing in a new window. So if you want to save that separately and compartmentalize your work, you can easily just move it into a new window. You can create a document from the email. So if somebody sends you a nice bulleted list of something, um, like this particular outline for a meeting, I can just create it as a document and put it right in Google Docs and either print it or edit it or share it with others. And I also like that I can quickly add everybody's contact information from these buttons on the side and see who all else is involved with this email without having to try and look at the header information. There's great search because it is Google, so you have lots of different fields for searching your information. You can search all mail or you can search particular labels. And I really love this. Does it have an attachment or not? Because I could have swore that the mayor of Chubbuck sent me something or other for the marquee, but I can't find the attachment. Well, I can actually ask that it search only for attachments. And that's one of my favorite features for search in uh, Gmail. And of course, you can set up custom filters. So I often filter a lot of the stuff that I need to be aware of, but not necessarily be supervising, like proctoring, for example. I don't actually do proctoring. I just supervise the proctoring done by my staff. But I want to be aware. So I can create a filter. I can also create filters for my local listserv so that when I'm doing, um, I'm having a cup of coffee or I'm just taking a break, I can go straight to that filter and that label and then just look at all of the stuff that's come in from that listserv, and it doesn't clutter up my inbox with stuff that is really important. So you have a lot of options for your filter. You can skip the inbox, which is something that I often do um, for things that aren't uh, that super important. Um, I can mark it as read if I don't want to clutter up my unread numbers. I can star it. I can apply a label. So I did this with my proctoring, um, apply the label proctoring. I can also forward certain things, delete it, all sorts of different options uh, here. And you can also create these canned responses. And I've never actually used the canned responses, but you can create them. And this way, perhaps, if you're constantly getting an email from a vendor, you can just create your response, your canned response, and they just get it every single time they email you. Okay, so let's move on to the calendar. We use the calendar extensively in my organization because it's shared calendaring and it's publicly viewable. So here is an image of the staff calendar. I do all the scheduling in the calendar and it's shared with the entire organization. That way everybody can see when somebody is scheduled, when somebody is off, and um, and they can see it quickly, they can access it, they can copy things into their own calendar, and it's all publicly available for just the staff. Now, this isn't publicly available for the community. This is just kind of internally public. We, I love the view options. I can change things, like for example, to the sixth day. Here's a picture of our desk schedule, because the desk schedule is different, of course, than our uh, regular schedule. But I like to look six days in advance, uh, which is great for planning for staff shortages or events or seeing what upcoming obligations may be. So one of my favorite features is that six day. And I also really love the agenda because I can see all of the stuff that's coming up. And you can choose the calendars that you want to see the agenda for. And you can use it as a great planning tool so that you can just keep a bullet point uh, of all of the things that you need to do. So um, the agenda view is another really nice feature of the calendar. As with any, any calendaring software, you can add guests. Oops. You can add guests. Um, and they can either invite others, modify the event, you can set it up as a repeating event. And I love that I can tell it to text me 
that's awesome to me because I, you know, I may be anywhere. I might be down the street. I might be at a chamber event. I might be anywhere, and my phone can text me. Um, and I've actually done this before where I was at a particular chamber event and I knew that the guy was going to run really long. And so I went ahead and just set up a calendar reminder to text me 30 minutes after the thing started so that I had an excuse to leave. But shh, don't tell anybody I did that. And one of the best features of the calendaring system is the ability to copy to other calendars. So in addition to keeping the staff calendar and our desk calendar, we also have a proctoring calendar and a meeting room calendar and events calendar. And I can create an event and then I can just copy it to another calendar. So here's an example of this duplication. Um, I create and book the meeting room for music and movement or book the Idaho room for the Girl Scouts. And if I want it to be publicly viewable on our website, I need to put it in the events calendar. And I do that just by going into the item and just clicking copy to which is really nice because I can also put something in my personal calendar and then copy it to five other calendars with just a few clicks and then everybody knows that I have an opportunity that I have an obligation or that an event is coming up. You can share the calendars. Um, most of the calendar, all the calendars are shared with the staff and most of the staff have the ability to make changes, but not all of the staff. So this particular calendar that we're looking at is the events calendar and only some people, or this is the proctoring calendar, I'm sorry. And so only people, some people can make changes. Other people just can see the events. You know, our children's librarian, Amanda, doesn't necessarily need to know that we're proctoring somebody for a chemistry exam but she can see that and then she would be able to um, budget rooms and things like that based around that uh, viewing the calendar. You can also use the web address to share the calendar online and we've done this with our events calendar. So here's a, an example of what the events calendar looks like. Um, and this is a link that opens from our website. So in this tab is our Portland District Library website. You click on the events link and then the calendar comes up. And if users click into the calendar item, it gives them all the details. The blurb that has been done, um, times, the people there, people in charge, and all that sort of stuff. Okay, Google Chat. We use Google Chat a little bit. I mean, <laughs> we have a very tiny building. Um, but it does play a role uh, in us communicating back and forth. You can have a chat client that's through your web or, or through your web browser, or you can just have the actual thing itself. And you can also have it on your mobile phone. So a lot of times I will be at Staples getting another ream of paper for the printer, and I can get a text from one of my staff members saying that, you know, will you also pick up scotch tape while you're at Staples? And so, you know, it's these very important things that directors have to do, right? So being able to get chat on your phone is pretty important. Here's an example of what the client looks like. And so again, you can see my staff who are logged in, or not logged in, um, as the case may be, but you can also see that the service desk um, is chatting with me. And sometimes this can be really nice because if one of my staff is talking to a user who is problematic. They can just open up a chat window and can just chat with me really quickly. You know, I need you to come out here because this person is being belligerent and they can do it very subtly without call, making a phone call, without yelling across the building to me or anything like that. So we use the chat a lot for that. And we also use the chat for sending links back and forth to terminals even if we're just sitting five feet away so that we're sharing links. And so that's really nice. You also can just use it in your web browser. So instead of actually running the client, you can use in your email, uh, you'll get pop-up notifications that you've received a chat. And it'll also show in the tab as well. OK, so let's look at the docs. And I, I'm very fond of the docs. Uh, we use them extensively. They work just like MS Word or OpenOffice. But they allow for total and complete collaboration with your peers. So you can create a document and then everybody can edit it. So here's a list of all of our documents that we have. And we have spreadsheets. We have um, policies and procedures. We have spreadsheets for programming and statistics. And we also keep our timesheets in our Google Docs. It's just an Excel type spreadsheet that you know logs in, logs out, and then we can use math to do vacation hours and all of that kind of stuff, but we're not fancy enough to have a time clock, so we just use them in, in uh, Google Docs. 
Here's an example of a document. All of our new policies that we're creating and reviewing um, are being published to our website from the Google Docs. So this is actually was written right here in Google Docs instead of Word, um, backed up in hard copy, of course, so that we have uh, something available, but so that this way we can just share it quickly with users on the web. Sharing is easy. Um, oh, let me back up. Right up here, hang on. right up here is this share. And if you click on that, then you get, um, there we go, this little window here. And you can grab the link or you can just share it with everybody in the organization. And in this case, you'll see here for the proctoring, the non-proctors can view this, but the proctors themselves can edit the policy so that if there's any questions or any issues that come up or we're collaborating together, they can co-author. And Google is, is savvy enough that multiple people can be writing at the same time and Google will capture it all, which is really kind of cool. You can also publish stuff to the web and you can either embed the code or you can just grab the link and just link to the item itself. And don't forget to check this automatically republish when changes are made so that any time that you make an addition, as soon as you click save, it's updated on the web. So let's talk a little bit about the Google Spreadsheets, which works just like Excel. Most of us have used Excel um, in, at some point in time. But again, you have the ability to use it with multiple people at the same time. So here's an example of our book order list that we have. Um, we do all of our book order requests now in a Google spreadsheet. So everybody, including Service Desk 1 and Service Desk 2, has access to this list. So a patron comes in, a patron requests a book, a staff member will go ahead and input the date, the ISBN, number of copies, title, author, and all of the information that I would need when I place the order. When I place the order, I mark it yellow to indicate that it has been ordered, and the staff, of course, know that they ought to search the order sheet before or the book order list before they actually put a new title down for order. But this way they can also tell patrons that, yeah, we sure did order the girl who disappeared twice. It'll be in probably in a couple of weeks and ready for you and we'll just give you a call. Once the item has been received, we mark it in red. And then, of course, once it's been processed, we delete the item from the list. Uh, here is another example of a spreadsheet, and you can see that this is an example of the collaboration. There's one other viewer of this spreadsheet, and there's different colors that indicate where people are. So this is me, and this is um, the other viewer. And if this was live, I could mouse over this, and a little flag would come up, and it would tell me who is editing that cell. But this way, multiple people can work on documents or spreadsheets at the same time. And I know that some staff in doing work have made races. They start, one, one will start at the beginning of the spreadsheet, the other will start at the end of the spreadsheet, and they'll work quickly until they get into the center. Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, whoever wins, usually the other person has to shelve or something like that. Uh, we use the forms quite a bit. Um, when I first took over here, we really didn't have a way of getting questions from the website or making book requests on the website, but you can certainly do information gathering through the forms. The form itself is easy to create. You just click File, New, and then Form, and it actually creates a spreadsheet that it populates. This form itself is very easy to make. You can add items. You can edit items or delete items or move items. You can drag them around. Um, this is an example of our have a question spreadsheet. And the have a question is linked to the website so that people, if they have a question, they can click on that link. And then they would get this form right here. They would have to input their name, their email, and their question. And that populates the spreadsheet. And here's an example of that spreadsheet. Um, again, we use color to identify if something has been addressed. So anything that is in yellow has already been addressed. Everything that is not needs to be answered. And of course, this is shared with all of the senior staff. And you can also set notification rules. So under the tools, there's this lovely thing that if form submitted, 
sheet one, then send email. And that means that is if anybody makes any kind of a question or orders a book or anything through the website, I get an email notifying me that that document has been changed. And that way I don't have to remember to go look at the spreadsheet every day. The spreadsheet tells me when there has been a change. And I absolutely love that feature. Um, you can go to the, just under forms, you can go to the live form. And that's where you get the link to share the form publicly. So you grab this link and then, or you can embed it. And that's how you put it on your website. So right here, this is a picture of our website, and you can see this have a question. And that is the actual form. So when people click on that, they get that form, and then they're able to put the information. And like I said, you can also embed the form itself. So if I wanted to have a post, because we use uh, WordPress blogging software as our website, if I wanted to have a post for that, I could just embed this whole thing by copying and pasting that into a, a post and embed the form right there on the website. But I prefer to do it this way because then it opens in a new window and um, it's not lost. It's always on the front page of the website. OK, just a few last minute things. Um, Google offers excellent training. And they have videos and quick start guides and images and all sorts of things that you can use for training your staff. There's web forums, there's how-tos for administrator, there's a lot of stuff out there. Again, if you run into a particular question or you have particular difficulties that you um, can't readily answer, um, you do have to kind of hunt those forums or pay for tech support. So that might be something to consider. If you can afford to pay the 40% discount for the business version of the apps, uh, you may want to go ahead and do that because there's been trouble, there's been times that I've had trouble with like spam and things like that and I was, my email address has been whitelisted so I'm unable to email my groups right now and the only way I can fix that is to upgrade and there's, you know, so if you're willing to take on that challenge, the free version is fine but you may want to consider if your library can afford it just paying that 40% uh, percent discount and it's not that expensive, so it might be something to consider. Um, when it came to training my staff, though, I found that one-on-one -on -one testing and training was the best. So what I did um, was just sit down with each person. And actually, let me go forward one more slide. Under the dashboard that we already looked at, there's lots of user training. So you can go to the App Center. And you can look and, you know, Google Apps has actually set up a whole workflow for you so that, you know, day one, this is what you do. Day two, this is what you do. Day three, this is what you do uh, for migrating all of your stuff. For us, there was no migration because it was new. Um, but if you need to migrate or you need to do extensive training with a lot of different people and acclimate slowly the workflow, Google has already done that for you. They have a whole workflow that they espouse. Um, which is kind of interesting. It can be a huge benefit. Um, but for me, like I said, one-on-one -on -one training was really just the best way to do it. So I went into each person's workspace, and we sat down. And I built up an exercise for each tool that we would be doing. So if it was chat, you know, I would show them how to talk to me. And with the spreadsheet, I would go ahead and have them put a book on the order list um, and things like that. And that was a lot of fun, actually. I mean, it took quite a bit of time, but I think it was the best way to acclimate my users. And of course, we are very, very small, so it took one whole day to train the staff with, you know, little half hour or one hour sessions sitting down. And what I would do is they would sit at a computer that they usually worked at, and I would sit with my laptop. And then we would just play back and forth with all the tools and go through all of the different things and the activities that I had set up. The other thing that I did is I found mentors among the staff. So there was a couple of my staff members who already had Google accounts and who had already had extensive experience with Google Apps. And I asked them to mentor the other staff. And so what I did is for a while I was scheduling people at the services desk so that there was a high Google user with a new Google user. And that way, the person who had the level of expertise 
with the tool was able to answer questions for the person who was relatively new and had just sat down with me for an hour or so. And that worked out really, really well for being able to train people to use the Google Apps. And it has been so successful that we even have our 80-year-old employee, Virginia, who still works for us six hours a week, uh, she is using chat and she is using the spreadsheets and she is using her email, which I think is really, really awesome because she has had no experience whatsoever, but by sitting down one-on-one -on -one and then pairing her with a mentor on the services desk, she was able to learn. And that was just really awesome. So I think it can be a complete success. Um, and that kind of is the conclusion of what I have to talk about today. Um, so are there any questions? Oh, yeah, I'm thinking there are. <laughs> Jasmine, first let me just say uh, thank you very much. Really, really appreciate this. And I do believe we do have some questions yes, from the audience. Good All right. Um, is a 5013C required for paid Google Apps for Education for Library? No. It is the 5013 is only required for the free version. So if you do not have a 501c3, you can pay for the Google Apps. Okay. Um, is your library part of a consortium that provides you with yes. a separate email account, or is this your only work account? This is my only work account. We are a member of the Library Consortium of Eastern Idaho, which is 24 local libraries. I am the third largest of those libraries and I'm small so <laughs> there's no local consortium that has a server or anything and you know I would also like to take this opportunity to explain that I very much live on the other side of the digital divide here and most of my users have smartphones now we only have a smattering of laptops that come in every day most of our users who come in don't have a computer at home Lots of our users aren't interested in audiobooks and ebooks because they don't have Kindles, they don't have iPads. Mm -hmm. The matter of fact, I don't know how many of you saw that recent report that came out um, earlier in the year that shows that southeastern Idaho has the poorest internet in the country. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So, I, I matter of fact, you when I read that. <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact, you sent it to me too. Oh. Okay. And, um, <laughs> yeah. But, it, and it's true, it's absolutely true. I live 30 miles from my library, and only three months ago was I finally able to buy DSL. Mm -hmm. So before that, I had dial-up or I had satellite, and that was the only way I could get the internet at the house. So we are very much living on the other side of the digital divide in this little corner of Idaho. So there's nobody else that's going to provide any tech support or any other email or anything like that. So this is 100% all we've got. Great. Okay, we have another question here. What are the advantages of Google over Microsoft Office Live? Well, I've never used Microsoft Office Live, so I can't talk about that. Um, I used the, I just started using the Google Apps. I think that Google Apps predates Microsoft Office Live and we had implemented that before that became an option so mm -hmm. we never really explored that and at this point in time um, I'm hesitant to encourage the staff to explore other options simply because they know this one <laughs> and I just yeah. you know if, if it ain't broke don't fix it type deal so it ain't broke yet um, so we're going to continue with the Google Apps even though there are other options so I, unfortunately I can't really answer that question Okay. Um, and uh, where, where can they access Google Apps for demonstration? Um, I would just Google Google Apps. Google Apps okay. for Education, Google Apps for Business. They do have formal websites and you can look and get information. Um, you can also call authorized resellers um, of Google Apps and they'll be happy to talk to you and answer questions for you without pressuring you to buy. Um, I've certainly done that, but I just Googled Google Apps for Education and uh, just took a look at the information there. It was pretty easy to sign up. Okay, good. And here's one. Uh, can you give examples of how you interface your Google Apps account with your library's ILS? We have not. There's absolutely no way because our ILS is so horribly broken and outdated and dying that 
we just can't integrate our Google Apps with our ILS. So all of the stuff that we do as far as the book ordering is outside of the realm of the ILS. And we're also small enough that we don't even use the acquisitions module in our ILS. We just catalog the stuff when it comes in, but we don't. We're just kind of a different breed out here. We're so small that we wouldn't even have a, this work time to use the acquisitions model. OK. Um, can you sister Google Apps with your own internal email system? We don't have an internal email system. OK. So there, I know that there are ways that you can migrate or that you can use the two of them concurrently. But again, this is really the only thing that we have. Um, I would look at some of the forums for how you would use those two things in conjunction of one another. I know that um, other librarian friends of mine have migrated off of like GroupWise onto Google Apps. And there are migration assistance tools. And of course, you know, if you're that large and you're coming off of a major client, uh, you're probably going to have to pay for the business edition. And then you get tech support that would help you migrate. OK. Do you get a lot of unwanted ads via the Google Information Share? No, we don't. Because we don't have, we have the free account but we don't have the free, free account, right? So there's this fuzzy line between us using the Google Apps for Education free version and the Gmail that you get with AdShare. So I occasionally will have ads that will come up at the top of my email, but there's no ads in chat, there's no ads in docs, there's no ads in spreadsheets um, or any of that kind of stuff. Um, if you pay for the business edition, you get a privacy policy, which I actually have a privacy policy as well with Google. So our information is private, and we don't have that, that ad share like you get with regular old Gmail. But if you pay for the business edition, you have 100% zero advertising. Great. Do you use Google Apps to build your website? No, I did not. I paid for uh, hosting with LIS Host which is extremely, ridiculously reasonable for public libraries. And then I just had LIS host provide me with a WordPress blog. You could conceivably use Google websites, uh, Google sites for your website, but I wanted to be able to use widgets that were available in WordPress as a blogging software so that we could push our Twitter feed to our home page, push our Flickr pictures to our home page, um, and all this other kind of neat stuff that um, WordPress would let you do. Okay. Well, that's all I'm seeing right now. Um, I, I'll just have one one last question here and see if, if any others come in on that. What, it, it sounds like this has been a, a complete and total success. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I think you need in your presentation a, a, the image of your one employee there, you know, giving like a thumbs up to Google Apps or something. Yes. But I, I could certainly do that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> we want to meet Virginia. Um, what was staff buy-in like when you first said, we're going to do this? I mean, I... I, I I know you, I, I would like to think you weren't dictatorial about it, but I mean, how did you roll this out to your staff and what was kind of the initial reaction to it? Um, at first they were kind of shocked, you know, because the legal pad had worked fine for years. Why would you change the legal pad? And, but at the same time, um, I started to talk to them about how, you know, I don't want you to use your personal work for your professional work. Not because I don't, you know, not because I, I care, but because I want to make sure that you don't inadvertently forward something that your son sent you to the mayor of Chubbuck. <laughs> I want you to have, you know, I want you to have a level of separation between your personal life and your, and your private and your pub professional life. And I explained to my staff that it was very important that the staff take the time that they need when they're at home so that they don't get an interlibrary loan request while they are answering an email at 9 o'clock at night. I wanted more of a division because, you know, my rules are for my staff is that you take your vacation time, you walk away from this building, 
and only if you are on call do you pay any attention to work outside of this building. So I talked to them about the importance of really separating that to make sure that they had the time that they need to recharge, live their lives, and be happy and productive humans, and then come into work. So that was one of the, the conversations that we had. I also showed them uh, how we could potentially change the way that we're doing stuff. And they were very frustrated with the lack of website. They were very frustrated with the legal pad because, you know, when the Hunger Games came out, somebody wrote the Hunger Games on the yellow legal pad. And then member number two in the community wanted that. So they wrote their name in parentheses. And then member number three, so they wrote their name in parentheses. And then member number four went up the side of the margin. Member number five went further up the margin. I mean, it was a mess. And I said, let me show you a way that we can change all of this and make it so that it's a little bit easier. So I did a lot of demonstration in order to get buy-in. And it was a very easy transition because there was nothing. And most of my staff had some sort of experience with Facebook or email outside of the library. So they thought it was kind of cool that we would be doing this stuff here. They thought it was kind of cool that we could get rid of the yellow legal pad because if Holly had the legal pad because she was making notes from another user and then somebody else is at service desk too demanding that we buy X, Y, and Z books, well, Penny had to wait for Holly to finish with the legal pad where now <laughs> it doesn't matter. They can just both work on the same thing together. So it was very, it was very easy. We did a lot of conversations before we actually did implementation. Yeah. Great. And I, and I think we want photos of some of those old legal pads, too. And, and, yeah. Uh, um, oh, I, dude, the legal pads are so gone. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not happy with that. All right. And I, we've gotten a couple more questions from the audience. So. We have one more here. Um, how do you back up your uh, Google Apps content? Um, the way I personally back up is I, I only back up the documents. I don't back up anything else. And I just download it as a PDF, and then I just store it on my laptop. And then we pay for a service called Carbonite, which is online backups. And then on, then they back it up. Um, as a part of our agreement with Google, because you do get this big old thick contract when you sign up for the Google apps. They have redundant backups, and so essentially you don't necessarily need to worry about backing up your Google Apps because all of that content is being backed up by Google. Now conceivably there could be a disaster and California could fall into the ocean and maybe they don't have a redundant server that's not in California and everything could be lost. So I take the extra step of taking the most important documentation and just downloading it as a PDF and then storing it locally and then storing it online in another online backup software. I mean, okay. Um, Jess, if we could real quick, could you bring up your last slide with your, your contact information again? Uh, that would, uh, we're getting a couple questions coming in on that. Sure. Um, and any other questions from the audience coming through? No, that's... Okay. Uh, we will also make, uh, there it is, um, so that'll get stuck in the recording, and we'll, we'll make all of this available to remind people of joining us. It's all being recorded. We will share all the presentations and the recordings and any of the links and things like that. Um, as soon as we are able, technologically, you know, eight hours worth of video editing is going to be real fun, um, which I don't plan on doing at home. Um, and, and we did get at least one comment that, that um, Jasmine sounds like an amazing director that everybody wants to work for. And um, Thank you. We, we also noticed that you were listed as a super administrator, so we were wondering if you had a cape. Um, uh, yes, actually, I do have a cape. <laughs> That's, that's great. I, I, I was inspired by, uh, I don't know how many of you know Joshua Neff, who yes. is yep. a superhero librarian in Kansas. And he posted on Twitter not too long ago about wanting a cape. Mm. And so I was like, you know, that's a brilliant idea. So I went and got a huge thing of felt, <laughs> and I have a cape. Yay. All right. Okay, well, Jasmine, thank you very much. We really appreciate this um, and for all the time you put into it. And it uh, sounds like everything's running real great for you out there. So uh, thank you once again. And we're going to go ahead and uh, wrap up your presentations.